Last Sunday, for the first time in the city of Indianapolis's history, the start of a pro football season had great significance. While the NFL is beginning its 65th year, Indianapolis is embarking on its first season as the host of a professional football team. The Colts had more or less worn out their welcome in their old hometown, so they were anxious to make a good first impression in the Hoosier Dome. Unfortunately for the Indianapolis Colts, New York Jet guard Stan Waldmore, number 70, was just one of the obstacles stalling the Colts' attempts to make good. While perfect pass protection allowed Pat Ryan time to hook up with tight end Mickey Schuler for two scores, Colt quarterback Mike Pagel wasn't afforded the same luxury. The new rule refraining the enthusiastic Mark Gastineau from celebrating after a sack could prove most detrimental to opposing quarterbacks in 1984 because now number 99 has that much more energy to rush the passer. Number 51, Greg Buttle's touchdown recovery of a Gastineau forced fumble boosted the Jets to a 23-14 win. Despite the loss, the Indianapolis Colts are still the talk of the town. As is the Redskins' Joe Theismann, whose sealed lips have made the presidential race back page news in Washington. Theismann has vowed to let his actions do his talking in 1984. Unfortunately for the Redskins, the rest of the team did not make the same pledge. Last Sunday against Miami, the Redskins' record-setting offense was out-muscled, out-played, but most surprisingly, outscored. Number 85, wide receiver Mark Duper caught two touchdown passes from quarterback Dan Marino who threw for over 300 yards and a total of five scores in the Dolphins' 35-17 defeat of the NFC champion Redskins. While the young superstar Marino has had little trouble filling the shoes of his predecessor David Woodley, Woodley's foot size would have to double to fill the void left by Terry Bradshaw in Pittsburgh. Woodley's first start as a Steeler began like a nightmare, while his counterpart, Todd Blackledge's debut, had all the makings of a Cinderella story. Replacing the injured Bill Kenny, Blackledge tiptoed into the end zone to give the Kansas City Chiefs an early lead. Blackledge is said to have the ability to take the Chiefs to the top. However, Woodley has already been there, and he displayed his Super Bowl arm in the second quarter. Woodley's 80-yard touchdown pass to rookie Lewis Lips, number 83, tightened the score to 17 to 10. But that would be as close as the Steelers would come to putting a damper on the Chiefs' opening day. Two third-quarter Nick Lowry field goals and a Blackledge touchdown pass to Stefan Page gave Kansas City a 37 to 27 win. Since 1970, only two teams have scored as many as 37 points on a Steeler defense. Not bad for a Kansas City Chief team predicted to finish last in the AFC West, led by a backup quarterback making his first NFL start.
When Minnesota's rookie coach, ex-Marine Les Steckel, met with San Diego's air commander, Don Coriel, they agreed to shake hands and come out fighting. The Chargers threw the first punches, punctuated with some sleight of hand. On the very next play, Charger quarterback Dan Fouts went directly to Wes Chandler. Good for 20 yards and the first of six San Diego touchdowns. San Diego used more razzle-dazzle in the third period when tight end Pete Houlihan connected with 18-year veteran Charlie Joyner. With that scoring pass, Joyner became only the fourth player ever to go over the 10,000 mark in career receiving yardage. Of course, the Vikings were prepared for the Charger offense. What no one expects from San Diego is defense. The Chargers held the Minnesota offense to just two field goals. And Gil Bird, number 22, delivered the knockout punch with an interception return for a touchdown to spoil the Vikings' home opener 42-13. This season, Denver's John Elway is playing like a shadow of his former self, which is good for him, considering his dismal rookie season a year ago. Before leaving the game with a shoulder injury, Elway helped the Broncos to a 13-3 halftime lead over the Bengals with a 35-yard scoring pass to brand-new Bronco Butch Johnson, number 86. Cincinnati battled back when Bengal Pat McAnally faked a punt and found rookie running back Stanford Jennings with a short pass. The 34-yard gain helped set up the first of two short touchdown runs, one by James Brooks, number 21. The 17-13 Bengal lead vanished in the final period when quarterback Gary Kubiak, replacing Elway, spotted rookie tight end Clarence K, number 88, for the touchdown that made the difference. Denver 20, Cincinnati 17. In his 12th season in Buffalo, Bills quarterback Joe Ferguson became the victim of rookie mistakes when his blocking broke down against the New England Patriots. The breakdown occurred when first-round draft pick running back Greg Bell overstepped his play fake. That left him out of position to pick up blitzing linebacker Andre Tippett, who leveled Ferguson for a 13-yard loss. The New England offense was equally effective, striking early and often in the first half. A 65-yard scoring pass from Steve Grogan to Stefan Staring was the Pats' biggest play of the day and help build a 21-3 lead. But in the second half, the two teams reversed roles. Buffalo became the aggressor and shut out the Patriots the rest of the way. Ram receiver Preston Denard, number 83, cut the New England lead with a short touchdown pass before Joe Ferguson and tight end Tony Hunter teamed up on the Bills' final scoring drive. Hunter's fourth quarter touchdown was not enough to overcome the Patriots, 
the Bills went down to defeat 21 to 17 and became one of 11 teams to lose at home on opening day. In a highly touted rematch of last year's playoff between the NFC Western and Central Division champions, the 49ers and Lions, Detroit sought revenge for the loss that ended their season. Throughout most of the afternoon, the Lions produced the big plays. None bigger than newly named starting quarterback Gary Danielson's 49-yard strike to Leonard Thompson. The touchdown tied the game at 27 late in the fourth quarter and fueled the Lions' hopes of revenge. But with just four seconds showing, Ray Wershing kicked a 22-yard field goal that gave the boys from the Bay City a narrow three-point win and left the Lions wondering what it takes to beat Bill Walsh's 49ers. In Chicago's Soldier Field, Walter Payton began his historic assault on Jim Brown's all-time rushing record with a 61-yard day against Tampa Bay. But it was the much maligned Bucks who set off the early fireworks. Number 87, Gerald Carter, scored on a 74-yard bomb. But even when John McKay's men managed to get into the end zone, the Bears' torrid pass rush was clearly evident. Finally, a quartet of sacks and numerous quarterback pressures produced six interceptions that turned the tide toward Chicago. This one by number 90, linebacker Al Harris, led to a touchdown. In his third season, Jim McMahon is now firmly entrenched as the starting quarterback. His fine play fake suckered two Buccaneer linebackers and enabled number nine to roll right and score on the beautifully executed bootleg. It was the first opening day win for Chicago since 1979. Significantly, that was the last time the team made the playoffs. Green Bay opening day marked the return of another superhero from the Packers' glory days. Coach Forrest Gregg vowed to put muscle in the Pack's porous defense, and the Cardinals' O.J. Anderson bore the brunt of the green and gold's newfound fury. Jay was held to just 51 yards in 18 attempts, and Green Bay's top draft pick, defensive end Alfonso Carriker, number 76, proved he's ready for Greg's tough defensive approach. Despite this, Neil Lomax and the Cardinals piled up 260 air yards, including touchdown passes to Roy Green and Pat Tilly, number 83. But the most spectacular receiver on the field wore uniform number 80. James Lofton had the 22nd 100-yard game of his career and Lynn Dickey and the Packer attack had just enough firepower to nip the Cardinals by a single point, 24 to 23. 
For St. Louis, it's obviously not in the cards. They haven't won on opening day since 1976. Green Bay enjoyed its fifth straight successful opener, its first under Forrest Gray. New York, New York. If you can make it there, you'll make it anywhere, or so the song says. Richard Todd could not make it there, but down in the Superdome, the Saints are praying that if he does make it anywhere, it will be for them in New Orleans. However, it appears that even in his new friendly surroundings, Richard Todd still has some of his same old habits. Last Sunday, the Falcons rudely crashed this Southern homecoming for the former Jet quarterback. Atlanta intercepted Todd three times, and with their star running back William Andrews sidelined for the season, it was just the kind of inspiration his replacement needed. Gerald Riggs, number 42, was making the first start of his pro career, and he made it count, carrying the ball 35 times for a team record 202 yards. This was a total team effort, though. Against the NFC's number one ranked defense of 1983, the NFC's number one ranked quarterback of a year ago, Steve Barkowski hit on 14 of 21 passes for two touchdowns. There was no doubt in anyone's minds that this short toss to wide receiver Stacy Bailey, number 82, was indeed a six-pointer. But the Saints must have known this was not to be their day when this 50-yard strike from Barkowski to wide receiver Alfred Jackson, number 85, was subsequently ruled a touchdown. Atlanta prevailed in this argument and in the game, winning by a score of 36 to 28. While the Falcons were putting a damper on Richard Todd's New Orleans debut, the Oilers were ushering the Warren Moon era in Houston. But it was a rough start for this million-dollar man from the University of Washington by way of the Canadian Football League. It was an intimidating Raider defense that gave Moon some very good reasons why he should maybe have stayed north of the border. Moon is a fleet-footed quarterback who is at his dangerous best when passing on the run. But Raider defensive tackle Bill Pickell, number 71, made sure Moon had nowhere to go if he scrambled to his left, while Greg Townsend, number 93, consistently pursued Moon from his right side leaving the Oiler quarterback with nowhere to go but down. The Raiders sacked Moon five times, but not before he was able to show off some of the talent that caused a half a dozen clubs to bid for his services. Defending Super Bowl champions ultimately came away with a 24-14 victory. But there is no question that Warren Moon possesses the right stuff to make it in this league. A little bit of time and a whole lot of patience may be all he needs. And that is one sentiment that New York Giant quarterback Phil Simms would readily agree with. After finally getting his first chance to start in almost three years, the sixth-year Giant quarterback wasted little time in challenging the Eagles for the supremacy of the sky. In the kind of game he probably dreamed about often during his two-year tenure on the Giants' sideline, Phil Simms had his finest day as a pro. The former number one draft pick from Little Moorhead State hit on 23 of 30 passes for 409 yards and four touchdowns, including this 65-yard tip drill toss to wide receiver Byron Williams, number 87. The first weekend of the 1984 NFL season did have its share of surprises. Phil Simms' stellar performance of throwing for the most yards ever against any Eagle team and for the most yards for a giant quarterback since Y.A. Tittle in 1962 certainly had to be one of them. The final score was the Giants 28, the Eagles 27. It is 
indeed tough to make it as a quarterback in the NFL. And it is probably even tougher in New York. But who knows? If Phil Simms can stay healthy, he just might make it there.